Hey there, how about reading God's Word together today? Today is number 330, and we read Nehemiah 10 and 11, Isaiah 29, Colossians 2, starting at verse 13, before we read Colossians 3. So let's turn to Nehemiah 10. The returned exiles showed how sincere they were in following the Lord. They gathered together for the express purpose of hearing the law. By this time, their language had changed so much that they needed thirteen Levites to explain what was said in the readings. The people wept because they realized how far they were from obeying the law of Moses, and also for joy in hearing it. One month later, the leaders gathered to explore the law in more detail, and they found that Israel had always neglected celebrating the festival of shelters. They did that for the prescribed week with great joy. Ezra read the law to the people every day. Then afterward, there was a meeting for confessing their sins, including the long prayer in chapter 9. This seems to have been an extra event, about one week after the festival of shelters was over. After that prayer, verse 38, the people responded, In view of all this, we're making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. On this sealed document are the names of our leaders and Levites and priests. Nehemiah 10 I, Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, was the first to sign as the governor, and then Zedekiah signed. The following also signed. From the priests, Seraiah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pashur, Amaria, Malkija, Hatush, Shebaniah, Maluk, Harim, Meremoth, Obadia, Daniel, Ginethon, Baruch, Meshulam, Abijah, Mijamin, Maazia, Bilgai, and Shemaiah. From the Levites, Jeshua, son of Azania, Binui of the clan of Henadad, Kadmiel, Shebania, Hodia, Kelita, Pelaya, Hanan, Mika, Rehob, Hashabia, Zakur, Sherebia, Shebania, Hodia, Bani, and Beninu. From the leaders of the people, Parosh, Pahath Moab, Elam, Zatu, Bani, Buni, Azgad, Bebai, Adonijah, Bigvai, Adin, Ater, Hezekiah, Azur, Hodia, Hashum, Bezai, Harif, Anathoth, Nebai, Magpiash, Meshulam, Hezir, Meshezabel, Zadok, Jadua, Pelatia, Hanan, Anaya, Hoshea, Hanania, Hashub, Halohesh, Pilha, Shobek, Rehum, Hashabnah, Maaseya, Ahia, Hanan, Anan, Maluk, Harim, and Baana. Heading The Agreement We, the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple guards, the temple musicians, the temple workers, and all others who, in obedience to God's law, have separated themselves from the foreigners living in our land. We, together with our wives and our children old enough to understand, do hereby join with our leaders in an oath, under penalty of a curse if we break it that we will live according to God's law, which God gave through his servant Moses, that we will obey all that the Lord, our Lord, commanded us, and that we will keep all his laws and requirements. We will not intermarry with the foreigners living in our land. If foreigners bring grain or anything else to sell us on the Sabbath or on any other holy day, we will not buy from them. Every seventh year we will not farm the land, and we will cancel all debts. Every year we will each contribute one-eighth of an ounce of silver to help pay the expenses of the temple. 
we will provide for the temple worship the following, the sacred bread, the daily grain offering, the animals to be burned each day as sacrifices, the sacred offerings for Sabbaths, new moon festivals, and other festivals, the other sacred offerings, the offerings to take away the sins of Israel, and anything else needed for the temple. We the people, priests and Levites, will draw lots each year to determine which clans are to provide wood to burn the sacrifices offered to the Lord our God according to the requirements of the law. We will take to the temple each year an offering of the first grain we harvest and of the first fruit that ripens on our trees. The first son born to each of us we will take to the priests in the temple and there, as required by the law, dedicate him to God. We will also dedicate the first calf born to each of our cows and the first lamb or kid born to each of our sheep or goats. We will take to the priests in the temple the dough made from the first grain harvested each year and our other offerings of wine, olive oil, and all kinds of fruit. We will take to the Levites who collect tithes in our farming villages, the tithes from the crops that grow on our land. Priests who are descended from Aaron are to be with the Levites when the tithes are collected, And for use in the temple, the Levites are to take to the temple storerooms one-tenth of all the tithes they collect. The people of Israel and the Levites are to take the contributions of grain, wine, and olive oil to the storerooms, where the utensils for the temple are kept and where the priests who are on duty, the temple guards, and the members of the temple choir have their quarters. We will not neglect the house of our God. Nehemiah 11 Heading, The People Who Lived in Jerusalem The leaders settled in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people drew lots to choose one family out of every ten to go and live in the holy city of Jerusalem, while the rest were to live in the other cities and towns. The people praised anyone else who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. In the other towns and cities, the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple workers, and the descendants of Solomon's servants lived on their own property in their own towns. The following is the list of all the leading citizens of the province of Judah who lived in Jerusalem. Heading Members of the tribe of Judah Athiah, son of Uziah, the grandson of Zechariah. His other ancestors included Amariah, Shephatiah, and Mahalalel, descendants of Judah's son Perez. Maaseah, the son of Baruch and grandson of Kolhose. His other ancestors included Hazaziah, Adiah, Joyarib, and Zechariah, descendants of Judah's son Shelah. Of the descendants of Perez, 468 outstanding soldiers lived in Jerusalem. Heading, Members of the Tribe of Benjamin. Salu, the son of Meshulam and grandson of Joed. His other ancestors included Padiah, Kolaiah, Maaseah, Ethiel, and Jeshiah. Gabai and Salai, close relatives of Salu. In all, 928 Benjaminites lived in Jerusalem. Joel, son of Zikri, was their leader, and Judah, son of Hasenua, was the second-ranking official in the city. Heading, Priests Jediah, son of Joyarib, and Jakin. Sariah, son of Hilkiah and grandson of Meshulam. His ancestors included Zadok, Merayoth, and Ahitub, who was the high priest. In all, 822 members of this clan served in the temple. Adiah, the son of Jeroham and grandson of Palaliah. 
His ancestors included Amzi, Zakaria, Pashur, and Malkija. In all, 242 members of this clan were heads of families. Amashai, the son of Azarel and grandson of Ahzai. His ancestors included Meshilamoth and Emer. There were 128 members of this clan who were outstanding soldiers. Their leader was Zabdiel, a member of a leading family. Heading Levites Shemaiah, the son of Hashub and grandson of Azrikam, his ancestors included Hashabiah and Buni. Shabbatai and Jozabad, prominent leaders in charge of the work outside the temple. Mataniah, the son of Mika and grandson of Zabdi, a descendant of Asaph. He led the temple choir in singing the prayer of thanksgiving. Bakbukia, who was Mataniah's assistant. Abda, the son of Shamua and grandson of Galal, a descendant of Jeduthun. In all, 284 Levites lived in the holy city of Jerusalem. Heading Temple Guards Akub, Talmon, and their relatives, 172 in all. The rest of the people of Israel and the remaining priests and Levites lived on their own property in the other cities and towns of Judah. The temple workers lived in the part of Jerusalem called Ophel and worked under the supervision of Ziha and Gishpa. The supervisor of the Levites who lived in Jerusalem was Uzi, the son of Bani and grandson of Hashabiah. His ancestors included Mataniah and Mika, and he belonged to the clan of Asaph, the clan that was responsible for the music in the temple services. There were royal regulations stating how the clans should take turns in leading the temple music each day. Pethahiah, son of Meshezabel, of the clan of Zerah and the tribe of Judah, represented the people of Israel at the Persian court. Heading, The People of Other Towns and Cities Many of the people lived in towns near their farms. Those who were in the tribe of Judah lived in Kiriath Arba, Dibon, and Jacobzeel, and in the villages near these cities. They also lived in the cities of Jeshua, Molada, Beth Pelet, and Hazar Shual, and in Be'er Sheba and the villages around it. They lived in the city of Ziklag, in Mekona and its villages, in Enrimon, in Zora, in Jarmuth, in Zanoa, in Adulam, and in the villages near these towns. They lived in Lachish and on the farms nearby, and in Azekah and its villages. That is to say, the people of Judah lived in the territory between Be'er Sheba in the south and Hinnom Valley in the north. The people of the tribe of Benjamin lived in Geba, Mikmash, Ai, Bethel, and the nearby villages, Anathoth, Nob, Anania, Hazor, Ramah, Gitaim, Hadid, Zeboim, Nebalat, Lod, and Ono, and in Craftsman's Valley. Some groups of Levites that had lived in the territory of Judah were assigned to live with the people of Benjamin. Now let's turn to Isaiah 39. After the prophet Isaiah told Hezekiah that he would die, in Second Kings 20, we are told that Isaiah only managed to get to the middle courtyard when the Lord's message came, answering Hezekiah's prayer. Fifteen years were added to Hezekiah's life, and he received the promise that the Assyrian king would not conquer Jerusalem. In his poem of thanks, Hezekiah said, But what could I say? for God himself sent this sickness. Now I will walk humbly throughout my years because of this anguish I have felt. Isaiah 39 
Heading, Messengers from Babylonia About that same time, the king of Babylonia, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, heard that King Hezekiah had been sick, so he sent him a letter and a present. Hezekiah welcomed the messengers and showed them his wealth, his silver and gold, his spices and perfumes, and all his military equipment. There was nothing in his storerooms or anywhere else in his kingdom that he did not show them. Then the prophet Yesiah went to King Hezekiah and asked, Where did these messengers come from and what did they say to you? Hezekiah answered, They came from a very distant country, from Babylonia. What did they see in the palace? They saw everything. There's nothing in the storerooms that I didn't show them. Yesiah then told the king, The Lord Almighty says that a time is coming when everything in your palace, everything that your ancestors have stored up to this day, will be carried off to Babylonia. Nothing will be left. Some of your own direct descendants will be taken away and made eunuchs to serve in the palace of the king of Babylonia. King Hezekiah understood this to mean that there would be peace and security during his lifetime, so he replied, The message you have given me from the Lord is good. Let's turn now to Colossians 2, where we'll start reading at verse 13. Note the distinction about old Jewish religious laws that Paul made in chapter 2, comparing them with the right-standing true believers obtained by union with Christ. We're not in a religion anymore. We're in a new relationship with God through Christ. Those old religious regulations had no ability to help one conquer our persistent evil desires. Following the teachings in the New Testament does indeed allow us to be freed from bondage to evil desires. One important way this deliverance happens is when we understand believe, and meditate upon spiritual realities such as those found in chapter 2, 13 through 15, and verses 20 through 23. We read other keys recently in Philippians 3 and 4, and if you're interested in more on this topic, I encourage you to follow the reading plan I posted in Uversion or Bible.com called Buckling the Belt of Truth. We'll start today rereading those spiritual realities I just mentioned. Colossians 2, starting at verse 13. You were at one time spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were Gentiles without the law. But God has now brought you to life with Christ. God forgave us all our sins. He canceled the unfavorable record of our debts with its binding rules and did away with it completely by nailing it to the cross. And on that cross, Christ freed himself from the power of spiritual rulers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them by leading them as captives in his victory procession. So let no one make rules about what you eat or drink or about holy days or the new moon festival or the Sabbath. All such things are only a shadow of things in the future. The reality is Christ. Do not allow yourselves to be condemned by anyone who claims to be superior because of special visions, and who insists on false humility and the worship of angels. For no reason at all, such people are all puffed up by their human way of thinking, and have stopped holding on to Christ, who is the head of the body. Under Christ's control, the whole body is nourished and held together by its joints and ligaments, 
and it grows as God wants it to grow. You have died with Christ and are set free from the ruling spirits of the universe. Why then do you live as though you belong to this world? Why do you obey such rules as don't handle this, don't taste that, don't touch that other thing? All these refer to things which become useless once they are used. They are only human rules and teachings. Of course, such rules appear to be based on wisdom, in their forced worship of angels and false humility and severe treatment of the body, but they have no real value in controlling physical passions. Colossians chapter 3 You have been raised to life with Christ. So set your hearts on the things that are in heaven, where Christ sits on his throne at the right side of God. Keep your minds fixed on things there, not on things on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your real life is Christ, and when he appears, then you too will appear with him and share his glory. But you must put to death, then, the earthly desires at work in you, such as sexual immorality, indecency, lust, evil passions, and greed, for greed is a form of idolatry. Because of such things, God's anger will come upon those who do not obey him. At one time, you yourselves used to live according to such desires, when your life was dominated by them. But now you must get rid of all these things, anger, passion, and hateful feelings. No insults or obscene talk must ever come from your lips. Do not lie to one another, for you have put off the old self with its habits, and have put on the new self. This is the new being which God, its creator, is constantly renewing in his own image, in order to bring you to a full knowledge of himself. As a result, there is no longer any distinction between Gentiles and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarians, savages, slaves, and free, but Christ is all. Christ is in all. You are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with one another and forgive one another whenever any of you has a complaint against someone else. You must forgive one another just as the Lord has forgiven you. And to all these qualities add love, which binds all things together in perfect unity. The peace that Christ gives us is to guide you in the decisions you make, for it is to this peace that God has called you together in the one body, and be thankful. Christ's message in all its richness must live in your hearts. Teach and instruct one another with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs, Sing to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. Everything you do or say, then, should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus, as you give thanks through him to God the Father. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, for this is what is appropriate for you who live in union with Christ. Husbands, Love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything they tell you, for that is what pleases the Lord. Parents, do not irritate your children, 
or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in all things, not only when they are watching you because you want to gain their approval, but do it with a sincere heart because of your reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. Remember that the Lord will give you as a reward what he has kept for his people. For Christ is the real master you serve, and all wrongdoers will be repaid for the wrong things they do, because God judges everyone by the same standard. Let me start us in prayer. Lord Jesus, help us to actually do what Paul says. We've been given keys to spiritual victory, but they don't work unless we pick them up and actually start to use them. We've been raised with Christ, and in a true spiritual sense, we are to consider ourselves as dead. Now, Lord, help us to set our hearts on things in heaven right where you are. Help us to fix our minds on you and on our being in union with you there. So help us to peel away layers of our old life and replace those things with our new self. This is not plastering a fake identity upon ourselves. It is our true identity that we have because of our union with you. We believe, Lord Jesus, that God's power who raised you from death is operating in us. Because we are now one with you, you are completing the areas where we personally were always lacking. Lord, I cannot list in this prayer all of the ways Paul exhorts us, so I pray that you will bring to my mind and to my listeners' mind the things you want us to focus on today. We pray that all our relationships with others will be transformed as we obey you.